I'm Mark Golub, and in the news, the debate over the Iran nuclear deal remains front and center in the Jewish world and on the American stage. The issue now centers on whether American Jewry should be pressuring members of Congress to vote against the deal. Many in the American Jewish community are adamant that American Jews must do everything possible to persuade members of the Senate and House, especially Democratic legislators, to vote against the bill and to override any presidential veto. The belief is that if the Iran deal can be blocked by Congress, the United States can force Iran back to the negotiating table and work out a much better deal based on America's original conditions, namely that the lifting of economic sanctions on Iran will be conditioned upon, one, Iran's dismantling its nuclear infrastructure, two, Iran's relinquishing the right to enrich uranium, three, Iran's acquiescence to a verification process predicated upon inspections anywhere at any time, and four, that these terms would remain in place indefinitely without any expiration or sunset provisions and without any secret side deals. This is the position of many American Jews. But there are also many American Jews who differ in one of two respects. Some argue that the president negotiated the best possible terms and that Iran will, in fact, need either never develop nuclear weapons or will not develop nuclear weapons for the next 15 years or more. And there's a third group of Jews who argue that while the deal is seriously flawed, the U.S. has no ability to reimpose a widespread sanctions program, and without internationally agreed upon sanctions, Iran would never need to come back to the table and would simply go on its merry way with the economic and diplomatic cooperation of virtually the rest of the world. And in this scenario, no deal is worse than the current flawed deal, and so these Jews do not want Congress to block the deal, but rather want Congress to extract military, economic, and diplomatic concessions from the United States for Israel. That's where the argument gets extremely heated, bitter, and contentious, and where it stands today. So for some clarity... I'm extremely pleased to have on our JBS phones from Washington now a man whom many regard as the preeminent expert in U.S. strategy in the Middle East, Dennis Ross, who after serving in the Obama administration as a major advisor on Middle East policy, is now with the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. And Dennis Ross, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. So, Dennis, you heard the kind of setup I put to this story. My first question is, where do you stand in general? Do you support the Iran deal, or are you leaning against it? Well, I'm undecided. And I'm undecided not because I think that there aren't good elements in the deal. I think there are elements in the deal that give you a high level of confidence that you really can block Iran from pursuing an enriched pathway to a nuclear bomb, a plutonium separation pathway to a plutonium bomb, or a covert pathway to a plutonium bomb for the next 15 years. And that's something that is uh, a meaningful achievement. I'm Dennis, also undecided. Wh Dennis, why do, you, why do you use the phrase 15 years? Do you feel that even if this plan does stop Iran from gaining nuclear weapons for the next 15 years, you are not as confident, confident about the future beyond that? I am not confident beyond that. The reason I say 15 years is because for 15 years, the Iranians are limited to a stockpile of 300 kilograms of low-enriched uranium, which is less than one bomb's worth of material. Today, they have 10 bombs' worth of material. Uh, and the deal would require them to reduce that 10 bombs worth of material to less than one bombs worth of material, and for 15 years, that would be the ceiling under which they could have uh, that stockpile. And so the enrichment pathway to a bomb is, is blocked because of that for 15 years. The plutonium separation pathway to a bomb is blocked for 15 years because the core
core of the current heavy water reactor is removed and filled with cement. A new core would be would have to be designed and put in, and it would yield much less plutonium as a byproduct, but also for 15 years the Iranians cannot have reprocessing capabilities, and even if you could produce plutonium, you have to be able to separate it through reprocessing to be able to produce a bomb. So for 15 years they can't do that. They can't have a plutonium-based bomb. And for 25 years it's hard for them to have a covert program because the whole supply chain, which is basically... When you have a when you have uh, an effort to enrich uh, when you have an effort to enrich uranium as a way of producing fuel or a bomb, it goes through a certain cycle. There's something known as a fuel cycle. The fuel mm-hmm. cycle depends upon being able to mine uranium, being able to turn that mined uranium into yellow cake or milled uranium. It's called yellow cake being able to convert that yellow cake into hexafluoride or a gas that is known as UF6 and being able to feed that UF6 into centrifuges that you purify and separate out the fizzo material. Now, each one of the links in that chain for 25 years will be subject to 24-7 monitoring. So it would be very difficult to be secreting away uranium or yellow cake or UF6 uh, or the low enriched uranium because every every step, every link in that chain is being monitored. That's why I say for 15 years, it'd be very difficult to have a bomb based on enrichment, a bomb based on plutonium separation, or a bomb based on being able to secret away and have a covert program. Okay. So that's, Thank- the, that's the good news. The yeah. problem is after 15 years, even though there's monitoring that goes on, there's no limitation in the size of the program that the Iranians can have. They can produce as large a program as they want, as large a nuclear infrastructure as they want, as large a nuclear industrial base as they want. Uh, and at that point, the, the gap between the threshold status they have and the weapon status that they might acquire would be very small. So my problems related to the deal aren't for the first 15 years. It's, it's my concern is that after 15 years, they get treated like Japan uh, or the Netherlands when it comes to the size of their program, but they're not Japan or the Netherlands, and I worry about what happens then unless you can create a firewall between the threshold status that they would have and the weapon status that they might be able to acquire. Okay. Dennis, I heard somebody explain that even after the 15 years, Iran is still limited to enriching uranium to, uh, uranium to only 3%. Is that your understanding? No, they're not. They're not limited after 15 years to uh, what they can produce. I mean, they, in effect, after 15 years, they're treated like anybody else who's a member of the NPT. That's why I say they're treated like Japan or yes. the Netherlands or anyone else. So they're not limited. They're not prohibited from doing that. They will be monitored in terms of what they do, but in theory, they could produce highly enriched uranium if they, if they sought to do so. And then, uh, again, that underpins the point I was making before. The gap between threshold status at that point and weapon status would be very small. Okay. People who support the deal tell us that we would have monitoring capability even beyond the 15 or 20 year mark. We would have perpetual monitoring capability. And that if Iran ever moved to begin enriching uranium, uh, uranium at a high enough rate to get to weapons grade uranium, we would know it, we would see it, and we would stop it. The, first of all, to what extent do you believe that's true? How good is our monitoring, our ability to see from the sky? And does that give you comfort? Well, I do think we will maintain a monitoring capability. My concern is the level of their output can be, will dramatically increase after year 15, not only because they're not limited by the size, but because they have five advanced models of centrifuges that they've already developed. They will be allowed to do limited R&D for the first eight and a half years and still limited R&D until year 15, but they will clearly have improved all five of these models of their centrifuges by year 15, and these five advanced models of, of centrifuges are dramatically more efficient than the current IR1 centrifuges that they have. So their output could, could grow exponentially, uh, 
Uh, and if they build their program dramatically, the, the existing monitoring approaches that we will have for the first 15 years and beyond, they may may not be sufficient uh, mm-hmm. after that, given mm-hmm. the size of their program. Still, I think it's fair to say we would probably be able to catch them if they began to produce at a higher level. But the key is, what do we do about it? I mean, what I'm trying to suggest is that if the gap between threshold staff and status and weapon status is so small, there wouldn't we wouldn't have a lot of time. Even if we could catch them, they need to know that if they do that, that that triggers the use of force, not sanctions. At that point, sanctions are too late. Yes. They can easily present the world with a fait accompli. So for me to address one of the vulnerabilities of this deal uh, and to, to deal with my being undecided, to, to see now that we have a posture that makes it very clear that if they move towards a weapon at that stage, that triggers the use of force, not sanctions, that becomes very important, and saying it now becomes very important because it gets the world used to the idea that that's legitimate, that that's the right response. And the more clear the world is on that, the more certain the Iranians are to believe we will act in this way, and that will increase the prospect of deterring them from doing it in the first place. Okay. A week ago Sunday, the president was interviewed by Fareed Zakaria on CNN. During that interview, Dennis, he seemed to say exactly what you want him to say, that if Iran in the future ever tried to, quote, break out, unquote, that he as president or any future American president would have no choice but to use military force to stop Iran from gaining a nuclear weapon. Number one, to what extent do you feel his statements on a, an American television news show carry you know, the weight that you want it to have? And to what extent, again, I ask the same question, does that give you comfort? Well, look, the, the clearer he is along those lines, the better it is, and it would give me a higher degree of comfort. In his letter to, the President's letter to Congressman Nadler, uh, he made some statements that were quite reassuring to me, but he made some other statements that I felt weren't strong enough. For, For example, example, yeah. He said... Uh, as I have repeatedly emphasized, my administration will take whatever means are necessary to achieve that goal, including military means. Now, that goal was referring to uh, the previous sentence that said, uh, you know, he was referring to preventing Iran from acquiring a nuclear weapon. The problem is, in the next sentence, he says, should Iran seek to dash towards a nuclear weapon, all of the options available to the United States, including the military option, will remain available through the life of the deal and beyond. The problem is if the Iranians are making a dash, it isn't the options, all the options that are available that matter. It's that they know that we will use force. I would have been much more comfortable had he said, should Iran seek to dash towards a nuclear weapon, we will use force to prevent it. I understand. Now, that is an important distinction in my mind, and it makes it, it's an unequivocal statement. And I think, for me, a, a sine qua non for being reassured, Uh, is that there would be an unequivocal statement in that regard. Okay. You know, Dennis, when I speak to those who support the deal, most of them say it this way. It was the best deal that the president could have negotiated, and that don't you know in the real world Iran is going to have nuclear weapons. That said to me, Dennis, over and over, Iran is going to have nuclear weapons. And what we have certainly bought is a period of time when they can't do it. But they say to me as if it's, you know, it's just a fact of life. Iran is going to have nuclear weapons. Dennis, to what extent do you feel that statement represents the reality of the situation that even you say to yourself, you know, Dennis Ross, at some point, Iran's going to have a nuclear weapon, and this deal, the best it can do, and maybe it does it well, is to delay that inevitability. I don't accept that as an inevitability. I think that's a very dangerous posture to have. There is no reason why we should accept that they would have nuclear weapons. In this deal, they forswear wanting, seeking, acquiring, or developing nuclear weapons. If people really have that view, then it means they don't even accept the words that the Iranians have adopted in the agreement. That's right. So I don't accept that. Uh, And when the president says that the agreement is based on verification, not trust, I would say actually it's, it's based upon deterrence. 
because verification means we catch them if they cheat. Mm -hmm. The way to deter them from cheating is for them to know not only that we will catch them, that we'll do something about it. Yes. What I'm suggesting is we need to reinforce the deterrent to ensure that they can't move from threshold to weapon status. And that's why I'd like to see a firewall created now, first by the language that the president adopts, making it unequivocal when it comes to the declaratory posture, second by making it clear that we will not permit them to produce highly enriched uranium and that we would treat that as a trigger and an indication of their intent to produce weapons and act accordingly. Okay. And, you're, and what you're basically saying is you don't feel that the administration has articulated that as clear, clearly as you believe it must be articulated. That's correct. Okay. Um, now, you talked about, I asked you first, do you support the deal, oppose the deal? And your basic answer was you're still in the process of deciding. The other question that's on the table, especially in the Jewish community, is to what extent should American Jews and Americans in general, Dennis, be doing everything they can to pressure members of Congress, Senate and House, to in some way block this deal and have enough votes to override a presidential veto? My question for you is, if that were a successful effort, do you believe that the United States could, in fact, do something that would bring Iran back to the table? Or do you agree with those who say, I'm sorry, that horse has left the barn, and if, in fact, Congress does block the Iran nuclear deal, the result would be even worse because we're not ever getting another negotiating uh, round with Iran, and they'd simply go on their way with the rest of the world supporting Iran. Where do you stand on the efficacy of stopping Iran by a, a vote in Congress? I, I am not persuaded that if you block the, the deal on the Hill that you'll be able to reproduce a negotiation. Mm -hmm. I don't see the other members of the 5 plus 1 being willing to come back to the table. The Iranians certainly will argue that they, they agree they don't need to come back to the table, and the other members of the 5 plus 1 also agreed. I think they would likely, certainly the Europeans would probably raise the question, how do you come back to the table? What is the American position? Who defines the American position? Does the American, you know, who, is it the president who defines it? Is it the Congress who defines it? Do they agree on a position? I mean, it's very difficult for me to see how you reconstitute a negotiation uh, at this point, number one. And number two, I worry very much that in that environment where we are the ones who are who are perceived as being the ones who block the deal, not the Iranians, that you'll begin to see the sanctions erode. Mm -hmm. Think about the following. When the, the most draconian sanctions that we got became real precisely because the Europeans in the year beginning in 2012 made a decision to stop buying Iranian oil. It reinforced all the other financial banking uh, and commercial and insurance sanctions, and it made the sanctions much more effective in terms of costing the Iranians. At that time, the perception was twofold uh, in Europe. It was that the Iranians weren't negotiating and that the Israelis were making it increasingly clear that they might act militarily. And so here was a way to sort of raise the cost of the Iranians in a way that gave the Israelis a reason not to act militarily. Uh, and that's what drove the behavior, the unwillingness of the Iranians to negotiate with a nuclear program that was proceeding. Now you have an agreement that was reached. While I view that the agreement has some basic vulnerabilities and flaws, the rest of the world doesn't seem to see it that way. At least the Europeans don't seem to see it that way. The Japanese, Koreans, and the Chinese don't seem to see it that way. The Indians don't seem to see it that way. Uh, and so if if it's the U.S. that is seen as being the impediment and not the Iranians, I very much worry that the sanctions will begin to erode. I don't believe the administration under those circumstances, even if the Congress blocks them, will go ahead and implement the existing sanctions. Mm -hmm. What happens when the biggest bank in China says, we're going to go ahead and start doing business again with the Iranian Central Bank? Are we really going to impose a sanction on that bank, realizing that that sanction will impose a high cost on us as well? And in circumstances where the president's own preference was blocked, I doubt it. Mm -hmm. uh, you go back to the 1990s, and you'll see at that time uh, the Iran 
Libya Sanctions Act was adopted, known as ILSA. That mandated that any company doing more than $20 million worth of business a year with Iran should be sanctioned by us. Now, that meant a lot of Europeans, Asian companies. President Clinton didn't implement those sanctions, even though it was law. President George W. Bush didn't implement those sanctions, even though it was law. So I really don't see uh, President Obama implementing the sanctions, and that worries me that if the deal is blocked, you're not going to reconstitute a negotiation, and you're going to see the sanctions erode. So rather than trying to block the deal, I'm focused much more on trying to fix the deal. Mm -hmm. And, by the way, the president would have the authority to, in essence, let the deal stand even if Congress blocked it. Is that correct? Well, in a sense, this is something that the Congress might, have, might take him to court on. In effect, what this deal does is allows the president to suspend the implementation of sanctions yes. that are mandated by law. Yes. Now, obviously, he can, the executive order sanctions that he has done on his own, he can lift on his own. But those congressionally mandated sanctions, he is getting, he currently has a waiver, and in a sense, he would be exercising the waiver not to implement the sanctions because there's an agreement. According to the agreement, the Joint, the joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, those sanctions are only to be suspended for eight years. They're not to be terminated until the eighth year. So, in effect, the, you're not asking the Congress to revoke any of the sanctions. You're simply asking the president to have the authority to continue to waive them uh, and to suspend their implementation for an eight-year period. So, in effect, he could decide that even though the Congress is saying these should be implemented, he could, he could simply direct the Treasury Department not to implement them. Yes. By the way, Dennis, we, we hear the number $150 billion, and some people have asked how much of that $150 billion, which would come to Iran over time once the sanctions are lifted, to what extent are they controlled by the United States? To what extent are they really controlled by other countries outside the United States? Do you know? They're not, they're, they're not controlled by us. These are, these are mostly accounts in foreign banks where the money that uh, it, the monies that the Iranians had from sale of oil is frozen in those accounts. Okay. Not exclusively for sale, but it's, it's basically not American banks. Okay. And what do you say to those who argue that countries will much rather trade with the United States and our large economy, which dwarfs the Iranian, the, the Iranian economy, and that if the United States were to take the position if you trade with Iran now, you're not going to be able to trade with us. In that instance, foreign countries would, in fact, once again get in line. They would align with the United States, and that in some way, some degree of effective sanctions could be reimposed on Iran. To what extent do you think that's possible? Well, I think it's, it requires the president to be prepared to implement those sanctions. And that's what I was raising before. Yes. I don't think that he will go ahead and implement those sanctions in the aftermath of the Congress turning it down. I mean, as I said, the Congress can try to bring him to court. This becomes then a separation of powers issue, uh, and it will take some time at a minimum to play out. Uh, and that's number one. Number two, as I said, think about the following. So the Chinese decide to test us, the biggest bank in China, uh, which does a lot of business with us, but also we do a lot of a lot of we do a lot of business with them. Are we going to put our own business that is very significant with the Chinese when they hold you know, large numbers of treasury accounts? Are we going to put that at risk? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I mean, it's the, the the question here is it's not a case that they have to choose between doing business between uh, us or the Iranians, because it depends upon us being willing to act on. If they test us to, you know, to, in a sense, say, yes, we're going to impose that price on you, even though it's going to mean we're going to impose the price on ourselves. And that rhetorical question you believe is really answered, we're not likely to do that, are we? I think it's, I think it's unlikely. Look, to be fair, I do think there are, there, we're already seeing lots of Europeans and others rushing to line up already to start doing business with Iran. I do think in the area of banking and finance, others will be more cautious to see 
how things unfold. Mm -hmm. Some businesses for sure will rush in. Others, I think, will hold back. Mm -hmm. We still, and, and President Obama has made it clear, he will still implement the sanctions that relate to terrorism, to money laundering, uh, to issues related to human rights. But he wouldn't be implementing all those re that are related to their nuclear program, and that does relate to a lot of the a lot of the bigger sanctions. Some of the areas where he would still be carrying out sanctions because they relate to, as I said, the other issues, it's quite conceivable that you will see some businesses, certainly some banks, some financial concerns, will decide to hold back to see how this is all going to actually play out in practice. Mm -hmm. So I don't think, even in the event that sanctions are lifted after the Iranians fulfill their major obligations, not everything is going to be immediate. You're not going to see everyone rushing in to do business. If this were blocked, you know, there would certainly be some hesitancy on the part of some companies and banks not knowing exactly what we would do. So they would wait to see. But those that would be prepared to challenge us, and many of these other governments, I think, would be prepared to challenge us because, you know, they're they're anxious to start doing business again with the mm -hmm. Iranians. So I, I just, I don't see this as something that produces an immediate collapse of the sanctions regime, but I'm afraid that the sanctions will surely erode. Yes. Uh, and, then, and then you begin to look at a scenario where basically the Iranians have 10 bombs worth of material, three months from breakout, sanctions eroding, and that's not a very pretty scenario from my standpoint. Mm -hmm. Dennis, you well know how the Jewish community operates, and you understand that there are those in the Jewish world who feel that this is a form of the Holocaust happening all over again, and that mistakes that were made in the 1930s should not be made again, either by appeasement or by American Jews remaining silent while the Jewish world is in some way put in danger. And therefore, there is this enormous effort, led by APEC, Dennis, to get Congress to block this deal. When I hear you talk, your analysis suggests that as you know, emotionally valid as that may be, it is practically unreasonable and even counterproductive in many ways. What would you say to American Jewry, listening to you here now on JBS, when they would say to you, Dennis, we have to do something. We can't allow a situation where Iran seems to be getting stronger, and even you acknowledge that after a 15-year period, they'll have the right to enrich uranium at far greater percentages than 3%. They may, in fact, have the ability to develop a nuclear weapon. You have not yet heard the President of the United States speak in such clear terms that Dennis Ross is confident that the message has been sent, America will use military force to stop Iran from developing a nuclear weapon. What do you want American Jewry to do, Dennis? And, you know, in a, in a private room, if there were Jewish leaders and ordinary Yidden asking you for advice, you understand what motivates them. What would you tell them? Well, I would focus on trying to fix the key vulnerabilities, and that's why I would encourage those, you know, those who are still undecided in the Congress uh, and those in the Jewish community who are reaching out to those who are undecided to focus on the key elements that need to be fixed to give us a significantly higher level of confidence that, are, that okay. in fact, and name, there will be a firewall. Between. Okay, and I'll, what are, I'll, name, I'll give you five points okay. that I would like to see done. Okay. Number one, uh, declaratory policy has to be much blunter and it has to be very clear. If Iran moves towards a weapon, that triggers the use of force. Two, if we see the Iranians producing highly enriched uranium, that will be taken as an intent that they're moving to a weapon, and that triggers. That should serve as a trigger. Three, we should provide the Israelis a massive ordnance penetrator, a 30,000-pound bomb, and the means to carry it, which is either the B-52 or the B-2. I actually prefer the B-2. Uh, given the cost of the B-2, we could think about providing it to the Israelis on a long-term loan basis. But this is significant because it sends a very clear message that we mean what we say, and that some may question whether the United States 
will use force, but nobody questions that if the Iranians were dashing, that the Israelis would use force. So the massive ordnance penetrator ensures that the one target the Israelis couldn't take out on their own, uh, the Fordo site, which is built into a mountain, they would be able to take out. Fourth, as again in the spirit of reinforcing deterrence, I would like to see uh, the, the U.S. adopt a position that if we see after sanctions relief that there is a surge in monies that is going to Hezbollah and the other Shia militias, that one, we will, or A, we will, uh, we will work now, even now, with the Israelis and key Arab partners to develop options to counter the Iranians when they do that, and two, we would also impose some targeted sanctions on their destabilizing behavior in the region. And the fifth point is that because I do expect that the Iranians will cheat along the margins, but not cheat in a big way, because if they cheat in a big way, the snapback function is likely to work. So they won't cheat in a big way. They'll cheat along the margins if for no other reason than to test how good the verification is. There needs to be a price for every infraction or violation, no matter how small. I would like us to spell out now and, and share and then reach understandings with the Europeans on what smaller penalties would be for smaller infractions because those are the most likely kinds of violations. It is essential in my mind that the Iranians see a pattern of behavior that is consistent and that makes it unmistakably clear. If you violate, no matter how small a transgression, you pay a price. Yes. That is essential for bolstering deterrence from low to high. You take these five points together and it addresses many of the key vulnerabilities that concern me. Okay. You were, for many years, a long period of time, advisor inside the White House. And then you left. And now you're making some what seems to be most intelligent and cogent suggestions on how we, to use your word, fix the deal. Why hasn't it happened already? And what, you know, what are the prospects of the administration in some way incorporating your perspective into their going forward? Well, I think that there is, there is the, look, the fact that the president sent a letter to Congressman Nadler that if you look at the, the issues that he raised, it addresses many of the questions I'm raising. It just didn't go as far as I feel it needs to go. It was a useful step, but it, didn't, it wasn't clear enough in terms of declaratory policy. It didn't say anything about highly enriched uranium. It didn't offer the mop. Uh, it offered a bunker buster, but the, 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 the BLU-113 is a 4,400-pound bomb that can't penetrate something like Fordo. It did talk about destabilizing activities in the region. I would like it to be a little clearer on that. Uh, and, and actually, on the issue of the smaller penalties, it suggested that it felt it was a mistake to telegraph what those might be because it could hurt deterrence, whereas I think, actually, if the Iranians understand, at least with illustrative examples of smaller penalties, they'll understand there's a price for smaller mm -hmm. violations, mm -hmm. and I think that deters it. And, and so the short answer to your question is, I didn't see the Nadler letter going far enough, and I do think that the fact that you still have undecided uh, senators, undecided uh, people uh, in the House of Representatives, those who are undecided, uh, I think, could actually go either as maybe as a group to the White House and say, look, this is what it takes for us to be able to move from being undecided to being prepared to support Very interesting. Uh, the agreement. And that's, Very, that's what I would like to see happen. I understand. Incidentally, did, did anything that either President Obama or Prime Minister Netanyahu do during this entire scenario, did either of them seriously disappoint you? Well, I mean, look, I'm, they're obviously, let me put it this way, I'm, I would like to see a highly credible trusted channel between the White House and the Prime Minister's office, and today that doesn't exist. And I think that needs to be recreated. Uh, and it requires two to do that, not just one. And so I would like to see both in the aftermath of this create that, number one. Number two, I would like to see a joint implementation, U.S.-Israeli committee uh, form, because I think that's the sort of thing that could do a lot to ensure that implementation, which is going to be a critical element of this, uh, is carried out the way it needs to be, and if there's any problems that emerge, those will be found and corrected. Dennis Ross, you have done marvelous work on behalf of the United States of America and efforts to bring peace in the Middle East. 
I wish you called Tuva Hatzlacha, and I am so appreciative that you gave us some time here on JBS. From time to time, I hope you let me call upon you and, and take your wisdom and share it with the American audience. But thank you very, very much, Dennis. Uh, it would be my pleasure. Thank you for having thank you. me. The thoughts of Dennis Ross, the William Davidson Distinguished Fellow at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. And, of course, he was for a long time a member of the Obama administration as the Middle East advisor. And he left, and he's now with the Washington Institute. And he has some very specific feelings about the strengths, the weaknesses of the plan, the Iran nuclear plan. And as well, uh, you heard him say that at the moment, while he says he's undivided, by the way, it's clear what he is saying is, unless certain changes are made, what he calls fixes, unless certain fixes are made, it doesn't seem like it's possible for him to support the, de the deal. At the same time, he is of the opinion, which many, many people are, many thoughtful, rational people are, that as much as we would like to see the deal killed in Congress, it is not a viable, it is not viable. It is not viable not simply because it's not likely, and it's not likely. But sometimes likely happens, and you don't give up the fight just because it's not likely you'll win. You do your best no matter what. I understand the principle there. But the more frightening prospect is that even if Congress blocks the deal, the president will have every legitimate ability to go forward, relieving some of the sanctions, and that the rest of the world is not going to come along and once again reimpose sanctions, and that the reality is, the reality is, that we will be in a worse situation if this deal does not go through than if we do. That is the dilemma. And again, many of you still may be trying to sort it out for yourselves, and I hope the people who you hear and see on JBS give you a better grasp for your own as you all <laughs> grapple with this yourself. And I'll continue to you know, be bringing you as many individuals of thought and reason and, and, and also passion as we possibly can here on JBS. As always, my thanks to Sloan Copeland, our director, our program coordinator, Serge Goldberg, JBS's associate director, Dara Golub, and the producer of this edition of In the News, Carol Lilienthal. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. Be well, my friends. Thank you.